Nation, Rob McGregor, welcome you to a place where all kinds of phenomena flourish. Voices whisper, ancient secrets, signs and symbols are abundant. UFOs, ETs, ghosts, and even the dead move about freely. Here we meet authors, researchers, and investigators of the mysterious, the strange, and of the inexplicable anomalies that surround us. Step out of the everyday world and take a journey into the mystical underground. <laughs> Welcome to the Mystical Underground. Thank you for joining us. This is Trish McGregor and and Rob McGregor <laughs> and our tech magician producer John Posey. You can go to the mysticalunderground.com where we make regular posts and where you can find out about our books. Among them are The Shift, Reports from the Mystical Underground, Phenomena Harnessing Your Psychic Abilities, Aliens in the Backyard, and The Seven Secrets of Synchronicity, among others. Uh, Trisha's latest novel is White Crows, and Rob's latest book is Breathe, a master diver's survival tales, co-authored by Rick, Rick Bedowa. Okay, our guest today is Teresa Chung. Since graduating with a master's degree in theology, she has written books on dreams, the afterlife, and spiritual related, other spiritual-related re matters. Her Dream Dictionary, A through Z, published by Harper Collins, is considered a classic in the field, and her Dream Decoder card uh, pack is stocked in the Freud Museum gift shop in London and elsewhere, I'm sure. Her latest title is Empower Your Inner Psychic, How to Harness Your Intuition and Manifest Your Dreams. Um, Teresa also has three brand new titles coming out in 2024, and she also hosts White Shores, the podcast for spiritual beings. Born into a family of traveling spiritualists, Teresa has dedicated her life to uh, mainstreaming and transformative power uh, and the transformative power of dream work and tuning into what is <laughs> invisible and unseen in our lives. Welcome, Teresa. Sorry, that intro well, took us so long. <laughs> I love it. And I just want to say, Trish and, and Rob, I'm just over the moon to talk to you both. My bookcase is littered with your books and your work. Oh, and I just great. Wow. Thank, thank you. you. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. a lifetime yeah. of inspiration. You are, I, I'm just in awe of you both. And it was when I found out I was going to come on your podcast, I was like, dreams come true. This is the law of attraction. <laughs> yeah. I have, honestly, I have yeah. poured over your books. They are okay. so important and relevant. And uh, yeah. thank you. I suppose you know about Thank the you. everything dream book we wrote, uh, wrote a number of years <laughs> yeah, ago. <laughs> of course, uh, your your that. book is beautiful, though. I mean, yeah, it's a beautiful book. Yeah. yeah, it's it's beautifully made. They, yeah. they did a really nice, nice job on that. Both book. legends. Okay, so it's yeah. an honor to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Well, so I have what, a question for you. Go ahead, Trish. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Rob. Uh, I was just going to ask. Uh, what does the latest research in dream work suggest? Uh, What's going on more recently? Well, what's happened recently, of course, is the explosion of interest in dreams since the lockdown, since the pandemic, uh -huh. when suddenly people were going on social media as never before and reporting, I had a weird dream. It just it just <laughs> gathered pace. Now, this has happened before. Like there was a uh, an interest in dreaming around 9-11 where a lot of people were dreaming about mm -hmm. towers and whatever. But this was unprecedented in dream research that we suddenly had this global phenomenon of people talking about their dreams online. And the wonderful thing about that is it has led to renewed interest in dreams. And I could not be more happy because I've been writing about dreams forever and their power to help you heal and transform from the inside out. So dream research is very exciting at the moment because there are so many studies, but where they're focusing is lucid dreaming, of course. That's right. 
you're dreaming where you're dreaming um and you know its ability to help you practice skills in the dream state but also with veterans i've been working with ions the institute of noetic sciences and been mm -hmm. following their study with charlie morley who i've interviewed a fellow brit of course and dr garrett yount who, who's a colleague and um and and seeing the, the brilliant um findings from that study that it can lucid dreaming can be used to help heal deep-seated trauma how exciting mm. but where i'm currently at actually that there is um, a growing area of research right now with precognitive dreaming that's yeah. Reve, the ability to dream something and then a few days later it plays out and i'm really excited by that possibility that we're kind of dreaming our future and and it's really giving a whole new meaning to that Roosevelt quote: "The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams." So, mm -hmm. it's a mm. wonderful time to be a dream writer at the moment. I I've never had so much interest in what I do from mainstream media, going on you know mainstream ah. programs where they do national call-ins. I've had this yeah. over here, ITV here in the UK, where they've opened up their this is their main flagship show, and they've they've opened up their phone lines. For me on air for people to share a dream and then wow. to, to give a, an interpretation that would never have happened 20 that's years great ago. it just shows right, how yeah. it, well, you also wrote you also wrote a book of precognition right yes i co-authored that with dr julia mossbridge who's one of the world's leading uh okay. neuroscientists researching pre-sentiment she worked with dean radin mm -hmm. where they were, were studying pre-sentiment that that's precognition when you're awake basically experienced yeah. through the body through heart rate and through gut instinct and um she's also fascinated by dreaming and of course if you can sense the future when you're awake as these studies seem to indicate you can do of course you can do it when you're asleep because you're the same person when you fall asleep and there's so much uh, research to show that the brain is predictive and it does mm. exactly well, the same in, in our sleep yeah, I've also found both fiction writers that a lot of times precognitive material comes through fiction. Does it for you, Trish? Yes, it does. I which bet. is it's very weird when it happens, but you know, sometimes I so I'm careful. I'm more careful now about what I write about. I mean, for me, it happened through a hurricane that I wrote about. So, you know, wow. we live in Florida, so it's but it, it it's relevant. also helpful. <laughs> it's also helpful. <laughs> for uh in writing for coming up with if you're blocked uh in mm -hmm. writing like a novel and uh just taking a nap or uh you know fo just focusing on okay what's going to happen you take a nap and you maybe you don't maybe you don't dream about it uh particularly vividly but you wake up and wow there it is you know that's that's, yeah, that's where i gotta you're not, go you, you're not no. sleeping on it or napping on it you're dreaming on it aren't you and, right and, yeah. And, yeah you know stephen king i've read many of his novels come from visions uh -huh. in a dream that that um misery for example he actually dreamt yeah. the plot of that and of course going right back to mary shelley Fla frankenstein uh -huh. that was a vision in a dream it is um a wonderful yeah. creativity hack and hollywood producers now are actually using their the dream state to help actors get in touch with their shadow side you know the parts and mm. oh wow <laughs> yeah you know, what there's i think jane campion with the power of the dog uh -huh. she got a dream researcher on set to help benedict cumberbatch um get in touch with the really dark and difficult aspects of his personality fascinating huh. isn't it this is amazing yeah, that is cool it's not long. Oh, we live in a good time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You you are ahead of your time. I mean, it's not laughed at anymore. It's right. not. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, yesterday I was on the BBC. You know, they often call me local radio stations, and I've also been on Five Live and uh, BBC Radio 2, where the host has had a weird dream, and they say, we're calling Teresa. <laughs> and yeah. I, I cannot believe it. As I said, I, I wrote my dream dictionary actually in 2002, 3, 4, and it's been reissued ever since. Um, yeah. When I first published it, it was like the publishers were kind of embarrassed because I was writing <laughs> about mystical stuff, you know, afterlife, near-death experiences, um, psychic ability. The same kind of stuff we write about. <laughs> yeah, but nobody would promote it. They would literally sign me up and then almost get embarrassed because two of my books were Sunday Times Top 10. This was a collection of angel stories. <laughs> it's like there was no promotion. 
um, uh -huh. and it's like, how did this happen? But because it's not scientific, but what is wonderful, it's a bliss to be alive right now as a mystical author, podcaster, what, whatever you do in this area, because there is more openness to it as never before. And I do think it really is. It's the lockdown, yeah. the world slowing down. Yeah. Where we I, I think. Yeah, I think there's also more interest now in some of the more advanced aspects of uh, dream recall. And uh, I, for example, controlling your dreams and manipulating the action. What do you think of that? Mm -hmm. Is that good or is that possible? Or <laughs> the, term, the term, I love this term, they've come up with dreamscaping. You know, you're not landscaping, <laughs> dreamscaping. Right. It's yeah. basically really incubating a dream, isn't it? It's going to yeah. bed, thinking about a problem, saying, mm -hmm. send me a dream with some symbolic symbols to help me brainstorm right. and make associations that's what it is and it goes right back to ancient yeah. times in, in ancient greece when uh -huh. they would the oracle of delphi and ask ask an oracle to dream <laughs> dream on it yeah, um, yeah <laughs> and i don't think though like the ocean you can never um fully control the dream state you can learn mm -hmm. to sail on it and navigate it but you can never fully control it it will always be unpredictable predictable and just I always find whenever people want rules of dream decoding or dream recall I give them a set of guidelines um mm -hmm. because I know uh -huh. the dreaming mind as soon as you settle on something it's going to surprise you again and throw everything you thought you believed about it out out, out, out up in the air again that's the, that's the wonder of dreams they love surprising you every single night so don't get <laughs> complacent with them don't think oh I've got it now as soon as you go like that your dreams will th throw you a mighty yeah, it's true <laughs> yeah, uh, Teresa, I, do you think do you think animals dream? I do. I've got my little doggy here, and he's I often, do too. I yeah, hope, <laughs> I hope so. I, I I believe animals are souls, and um, apparently there was some research recently. They actually dream of their owners. That's what I don't oh, know. I don't know how that research. <laughs> I don't know how they did it. Maybe they're looking at areas of the brain with facial recognition. I don't know. Because apparently when you're dreaming, uh, the area of the brain to do with facial recognition is the same when you're awake. Now, isn't that interesting? Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. Um, so I don't know well, how they Well, I, I just... <laughs> but I, I've always thought that, especially like when you lose a pet and the, the, the one surviving pet kind of mopes around and sometimes they gaze off into space or they make noises while they sleep. You know, like, oh, Absolutely. you know, like I'm suffering, you know. Yeah, it's this one. <laughs> I brought mine. Uh, okay. oh, oh. <laughs> now I'm telling you, with, with this world of social media, I can do all these deeply profound quotes from Gandhi or whatever. I put him on, <laughs> goes crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I <hope> this helps. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah, very you, happy I'm, there. I'm, I've definitely observed my dog uh, in uh, in REM, and, uh, and, uh -huh. and and I've definitely noticed at times, you know, he'll uh, he'll run in his sleep. So yes, he, they're they're probably, there's something there's something going on there. So. Oh, yeah, they're, they're, they must be oh, dreaming. Yeah. There's something going on there. There has to be a, <laughs> a lot of people. Their relationship with their pets is so strong, and and love yeah. in all its forms, as as I'm sure you agree, goes on. And I truly believe pets in the afterlife and actually if they're not there i'm not sure i want to go so <laughs> i know okay, okay. No. Under the, the rainbow bridge <laughs> you know if that if there is one <laughs> so Teresa, who are the characters that come in our dreams are they uh fictional characters that we've created in the dream state uh could there also be like uh, a spirit guide or s somebody also there uh I guess or a combination it's <laughs> awareness is in waking life because if you're a jungian dream interpreter it'll be mm -hmm. archetypal the archetypes come in that, that you know the people in your dreams represent archetypes you know classic right. mind, or far, yeah. or symbolically reenacted or more the gestalt approach where it's all aspects of you symbolized um and if you're deeply spiritual mystical believe in angels and spirit guides and all that then you're gonna if your dreaming mind reflects your waking consciousness and what you mm -hmm. you are more inclined to, to believe in because the dreaming mind i believe is constantly searching during the day for to to, to research to serve things up in your dreams that are going to resonate with you so that you're going to sort of have a shift in awareness when they appear, that when you wake up, you're going to remember, they speak to you. 
Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I very much, I look at all the schools of dream interpretation and I, I kind of like, I'm very eclectic when in my dream work and my dream dictionary A to Z, I did that. I didn't go with any one specific school. I kind of did a smattering of everything, including back in 2002 precognition that there are some dreams that uh -huh. flash forwards, you know, glimpses into the future. Um, but ultimately, um, I, I, if you, when I interpret my dreams, I tend as I get older, maybe I'm getting more sort of self-absorbed. I don't know. I tend to look at it <laughs> as a dramatic reenactment of what's happening in my mindset. Like, mm -hmm. now, do you keep a dream journal? I have do you done keep a dream journal. I have, I have libraries and libraries and libraries of it. Now <laughs> I, I keep them voice notes because what I find sometimes is I wake up and I have so many dreams on my mind. I, my handwriting is so terrible. I, I do it in yeah. a voice recorder. Um, but yeah, yeah, I do. And it's it's the best read ever. It's great, actually, to go back in time to say, read your teenage dreams. Not what, uh -huh. you, you know, and I what I do is I keep them side by side, just keywords. I mean, I, otherwise you spend all your life writing just keywords. Yeah. And to see how yeah. my dreaming mind has constantly been commenting on narrating brainstorming, glimpsing potential futures a lot. I, I think looking at your your dreaming life alongside your waking world is the best read ever. It's better than Netflix. It's something you can <laughs> choose. It's the <laughs> longest running TV show ever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I go uh, back and look you... on my dream journal sometimes and uh, I have no recollection on it at all. And that's a very interesting <laughs> dream. I, I'm glad I wrote it down because no, no memory of it at all. <laughs> Why write it down? I, I ha that's the mantra. The first rule of dream work is write down your dreams. The second rule of dream work is write down your dreams because yeah. you have to do that because it's too subtle, isn't it? And gentle for the world right. of the unconscious. It can't compete with ego, reason, and logic because that's the one thing, the things that are missing in your dream state are reason and logic. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you- Are you familiar with, <clears throat> are you familiar with Andy Paquette? He wrote I do. a book. Yes, 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 I am. <laughs> Remember yes. that dream he had? Yeah. I mean, and there's a case where he dreamed about his death yes. and prevented it. Yeah, well, I, I mean, yeah. essential futures. I mean, like Lincoln's famous dream of his own demise. Uh -huh. Right. But what I think, I think, because people get scared when you say dreams glimpse the future. And I'm actually doing quite a lot of workshops and courses on this at the moment. People are, are frightened about that. Oh, I dreamt of a car crash or I dreamt I was drowning. <laughs> and what I'm saying is this is a symbolic reenactment re of your mindset. And what it's showing yeah. you is the potential future that if you continue thinking, acting and feeling the certain way the mindset you currently have is heading in that direction but uh -huh. you can course correct and that's why na nightmares are transformative gifts because they give you the opportunity to change the future your current actions thoughts and feelings are steering you towards it's showing mm -hmm. the inevitable conclusion if you carry on doing what you're doing right now so every time you wake up with a dream that you didn't really like the feeling of or the scenario <laughs> presented wonderful opportunity something in your waking life needs to give needs to shift mm -hmm. um because mm -hmm. then your dream will reflect that the next night that shift and show you a hopefully a better future one you're a bit more uh, happy. that has no car crash <laughs> hopefully <laughs> well the car crash is, is metaphorical isn't it it means that you've come yeah. to a moment in your life when you feel you're on your knees and you know, you've tried everything and it's not working out or there's chaos and confusion. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the majority of our dreams, as I say, I, I believe, and I'm sure you do are symbolic, but then as I said, dreams love to surprise and you get these rare literal instances as well. As yeah. I said, sometimes you refuse to be tamed. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. the dream dream symbols are little challenging to interpret like uh if you dream of snakes i mean there's so many variations <laughs> on what that means i mean in the native american culture the, the snakes are powerful beings and uh in christian culture it's something else completely and you know then you have snake in the grass and all and kinds Fro of different freudian ways. analysis as well which yeah. goes deep down <laughs> right, into yeah. Libido and all that yeah but what i what i say to people because yes you're right and um like my dream dictionary at first of all i say your personal association is key mm. always go mm -hmm. for that first but if nothing comes up like you dream to something like you know a, a dice or something and it has no association my dream dictionary and i'm sure the ones that you've wrote are great to look at because that will kick start symbolic thinking because a lot of people right. struggle. if you weren't like 
keyed into literature at school or interpreting poetry or art. You know, that's, you know, it because the dreaming mind speaks like a poet or an artist. Um, and that's the kind of, a, you need to learn how to think symbolically. We once ha all had that ability, I believe, in ancient times, and we've kind of lost sight of it. And then I say, well, go through all the common associations, and then something in your gut will resonate. You've got to mm -hmm. wait for that, ding, I get it. Yeah, yeah that go feeling, more, right. Until you get yeah, goosebumps. Exactly. You'll get a moment exactly. and listen to it. And usually it's in your gut, or your heart heart will speed up or something. You'll, you'll yeah. feel it. And if you don't, let it go. You've got so many dreams there. Dream another dream. People right. get hung up on just one dream. Just let it go. There's yeah. always a dream. Yeah, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that you were born into a family of traveling spiritualists. Yes. What, yeah. what is that? Explain to me what that is. <laughs> well, in five minutes or something. Me, mediums, basically psychics, astrologers, dream decoders, uh -huh. and um, I can remember my earliest memories about four or five going to medium demonstrations and talking to dead people and it being totally normal <laughs> at breakfast you talk about your dreams and I thought that everybody did this because I was home educated as well and then when I was suddenly blessed to get a place at King's College Cambridge I don't know how that happened because I wanted actually to go into the Christian church I was very seeped in Christianity and I read theology at King's College Cambridge religion um uh, but when I went there, of course, in Academica, hot house that it is, I realized that when I started talking about dreams and, and you know, the heart goes <laughs> on, everybody like raised an eyebrow. It was deemed a big no-no. You don't talk like yeah. that scientific. Yeah. So I researched dreams in religion, et cetera. But of course, when I was at university, I studied all the religions. And as often happens with people who are stuck with one religion, when they're presented with the beauty of all the others, they realize they're all paths to the same Go mm -hmm. and I'm like many people, spiritual but not religious. And I think each path is utterly beautiful. But then when I left university, I decided I was going to try and understand my own family, you know, because my, my mother Interesting. was in different culture. My father was disabled and 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 English. So it was a very unusual background I came in. And uh, as I said, I always wondered when I was sitting there at Cambridge with all these Etonians and terribly shy. <laughs> What was I doing there? I felt like I was kind of like some poster girl for poverty there. I really didn't <laughs> understand. What, what it did is it enabled me that when I left and I wanted to write about these topics, the publishers mm -hmm. let me do it. They still were kind uh -huh. of embarrassed about it, but I, they could always say, well, she's got the academic credentials. And that's what right. was a blessing for me. And that's why I've been in the position to have book opportunity after book opportunity. Uh -huh. um, and recently, in 10 years ago, I decided to get a dose of self-confidence and reach out to scientists like Dr. Julia Mossbridge, Dean Radin. Mm -hmm. And I was very nervous. I thought they would just laugh at me because my books are a collection of anecdotal stories uh, of people who believe in the afterlife, angels, dreams, etc. And And what I found is that they welcomed me and allowed me to collaborate with them on projects, blogs. That's great. Yeah, and I still work a lot with IONS with their 50th anniversary I was presenting. Um, and uh, I come in sort of like, I'm not a scientist. I, I'm not going to claim to be a scientist and I'm not going to talk uh, about quantum theory as a lot of people do in this movement when they really it's scientists who need to talk about that. But it's wonderful now that I can bring in psychiatrists, psychologists, scientists and then empower your inner psychic. I deliberately do that. Every time I make a point... I preface it with a footnote, either pointing to research or an episode of my podcast where I've talked to these leading academics, uh -huh. you know, mm -hmm. people, you know, all the people at IONS, Dr. Arnold DeLorme, people like that. When I mention the power of mind wandering, for example, I said, go and listen to an interview I've done with Dr. Arnold DeLorme so that people mm -hmm. so I've kind of made empower your in inner psychic interactive with my own podcast so that people can feel comfortable that when I make a point, it's not just me saying, I see right. angels, which I think a lot of people do in this movement. They stand up and they say, I've had an afterlife dream, a near-death experience, I see angels. Mm -hmm. That's their mm -hmm. personal experience. Great for them. But a lot of people haven't had those experiences. And I think they want a little bit more than someone's personal story sometimes. Uh -huh. so I do try and yeah. bring in the science. Sorry, long answer. I go on a tangent. Sorry. No, that, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. So What's the relationship of uh, dreaming and out-of-body experiences? I, I separate the two. I think dreaming is very much contained 
within in the body. Um, out of body experiences, I haven't researched as much as I like. Um, I don't think that you're because people get scared of it, don't they? They think their soul is going to disappear. <laughs> right. and, and I always try and reassure them that <clears throat> it's always going to be remain connected to your body. I think maybe it's just a higher higher level of dreaming. Yeah. That's what I think. I, and I think in the dream state, where do we go in the dream state? Is every dream out of body? I mean, I love your thoughts on that. You're the experts. I enlighten me, help me. <laughs> well, I do I, what, yeah. Well, I think there's two different ways of looking at it. Uh, was a, some of the most uh, dramatic dreams in my life have been flying dreams, where uh, ru taking running steps like I'm on the moon each step is getting longer and longer and then I'm in the air and here's the important thing I always think why do I forget this I know I can do this why do I always forget it you know that's that's what always amazes me now I'm not sure this is an out-of-body dream or just a, a flying dream but it's kind of a connection there and I think uh with out-of-body experiences you can you know program yourself to go into that from uh a, just a light sleep uh you know where you're uh you're laying in bed and going through this method of uh raising the vibrations and the robert getting out your... method right yeah, yeah yeah and you're really not dreaming you are out of your body so i'm, I'm separating in two different well of course in uh, near-death experiences that's the first step isn't it uh rising out and seeing your body down mm -hmm. below whether yeah. it is just a really advanced dream or well, that's truly happened. I I I don't know. I, I I certainly don't have all the answers. But whether it's a dream or I don't want people to think that out of body is better than a dream. I think every single dream is evidence that you are more than your body, uh -huh. more than your mm -hmm. mind. You're a spiritual yeah. being having a human experience. And whether you're out of body or you're just dreaming that you're driving in your car going to work, for me, both are so valuable and, and uh -huh. wisdom, uh, connecting you to a part of you that is unseen. And if you believe in life after death, that's the part of you that I believe goes on. And the trouble is most people are so frightened of their dreams and and, and and aren't that content in the dream state. So I'm kind of making my life mission at the moment. Happy dreams, happy life. You know, that's what I believe. <laughs> Start working on right. your dreams and make sure you work on your dreams. Un and if they are unhappy, understand them because they're trying to tell you something that every dream uh -huh. is trying to tell you something important. And if you have this wonderful committed relationship with your dreams, I have seen people's self-esteem soar. I do think that dream work is a wonderful way to boost your self-esteem and, and uh -uh. to love yourself from the inside out, which mm -hmm. I guess is the journey of all our lives, isn't it? Yeah. That's a that's a really good attitude. <laughs> yeah. e e even uh, academics would love that one. <laughs> well, I'm trying to believe them. <laughs> and I, I hate I hate to interrupt the conversation because it's going so well, but uh, but we're at our we're at our thirty minute mark. So. Oh, Thank okay. you. Well, I, we don't so want to keep you. Oh, well, this has been great, Teresa. It's wonderful yeah, we'll, to meet you. And I hope we'll have to we do it. Do we'll have to do it again with a longer one. Definitely, I would love that. And as I said, because it's weekend here in the UK, I normally would have a wonderful starry night backdrop for you. I love. I have great fun <laughs> with my backdrops when I do interviews to surprise yeah, people. Because okay. I think dreams right. surprise, so I like to surprise. So I'm sorry, this is just me at home <laughs> with my doggy. Okay. Yes, with your dog. <laughs> Well, thank great, you so great, much. We're so yeah, glad. Yeah, great, great thank talking you so to you. <laughs> Aww. Yeah. And, and where, Judy. where can where can people get in touch with you or find you on online? Uh, keep up. Well, with thank you very doing. much. I'm at the Teresa Chung on Instagram. I have an author page on Facebook and X, and I am also www.teresachung.com, and you can find out about okay. my long and winding journey in this area. <laughs> really, uh, lifelong. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thanks thank you so very much. much. Talk Great soon. talking to you. Okay. Yeah. Take, Take care. care. Thank okay. you. I know. Thank you. And uh, I just want to I just want to circle back around and make clear to any, to everyone that my earlier comment, uh, my dog does not sleep run. He does not move around <laughs> when he sleep runs. He's on his side. He's laying on his side, and but his feet are moving in a <laughs> in a motion that like suggests he's running. He's running. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. All right.
Thank you.